resume. There we go. We'll give it one more minute or so for everybody to, to join in. How's everybody doing today? Getting towards the end of the week. Is anybody else just quite feeling fresh. a bit bit less than fresh right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> end of the week we're coming up to school holidays how are you doing emma um i've already got one on school holidays and oh. one on school. so yay a bit of a juggle, a juggle. keeping <laughs> entertained have you been traveling much emma i think last time i spoke to you, you were in Mackay or somewhere yeah not for a little while not for a little while i was in townsville but um townsville, that's right yeah no um potentially towards the end of the year i will be but yeah, nice. Not lovely. as much. Lovely. Yeah. Who else have we got here? Let's see. Admit. Here we go. Got just a couple more joining in. Go. So at any point today, if you've got a question, this is going to be a very interactive session. Uh, no boring long monologues. So we'd love your questions and your comments. Please throughout we're not going to wait till the end I'll ask you a few questions to get things started but let's let the conversation flow really organically today uh, because we've all coming at this from different perspectives as well so um, it's it's a big topic to tackle on a lunch hour hopefully you've all eaten as well hi Emma hello, hi hello. Emma you look cold Emma <laughs> oh it's freezing goodness yes <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we might kick off. Uh, before we, we get into it more uh, officially, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are today. For me, that's the Yagara and the Turbul people here in Mianjin in Brisbane. And if you're elsewhere, perhaps you would like to type into the chat whose country you are working from today. I would like to acknowledge the elders, past, present and emerging and ex I would like to extend that respect and acknowledgement to any First Nations people joining us today or who are watching this recording later. So my name is Mel Loy. I'm the president of the IABC Queensland chapter. It is great to have you here this afternoon. And I'm super excited to have Erica as our guest speaker. If you don't know Erica, if you, you want to know Erica, there is nothing Erica doesn't know about communications careers and the market and hiring and finding your dream job. So we are delighted to have Erica here, a longtime friend of IABC Queensland. And she also looks after the Brisbane Corporate Affairs Network, which uh, they put on events every now and then on really topical things for corporate affairs professionals. So keep an eye out on that. So uh, without further ado, we will get amongst it today. I'm going to open with a question to Erica. And as I said at the start, if you've got questions throughout, please pop them in the chat and we will keep this conversation just going very organically. So Erica, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. My first question is, it's a pretty big one. What's happening in the market right now from a careers perspective for communicators? Awesome. Okay, cool. So the market, I get asked this question a lot. And if you were looking at the news or hearing the radio, everyone's thinking, oh my God, there's a downturn coming. There's, you know, it's looking um, kind of negative. Whereas what we're experiencing right this moment is it's still quite positive. So if you spoke to my wider colleagues in you and you, there is a softening of the market. But when I say softening of the market, what we have to remember is that the last three or four years has been really crazy. So you would know that, Mel, there's been so much demand for work, for output, for content. Um, you know, people have been spending because they've been staying at home. Um, so the market for like the last three or four years has been unusual. So there would be, you'd be like every recruitment company has had their biggest years ever. So where we're coming down to is actually just where we were where we should be for this is a more natural level so we're not going into a in terms of employment at this present we're not looking at going into anything like you know uh, the global financial crisis where unemployment was high unemployment is still has a three in front of it I think it's like 3.75 percent which is super low so more broadly the market is still good and in terms of comms specifically it's very good at present based predominantly on government spending. So that's to do where I'm busiest at the moment is anything to do with energy. So um, 
Queensland, I'm not sure if you haven't read up on the Queensland Energy and Jobs Plan, but that's what the, the government is taking to the election. And it's about us moving to away from coal into renewable energy. So, um, you know, place organise government owned corporations like Powerlink um, are recruiting a lot, um, Energy Queensland, everything to do with energy and renewable energy is absolutely a space that you want to be looking at. So that because of that, that's definitely keeping the market you know, pretty buoyant at the moment. When you talk about that being a specific focus for the government right now, is it necessary for comms pros to have a background in energy and renewables in order to get a foot in the door? Or what are you seeing in terms of the hiring trends, I guess, in that sure. sector? So where we're at, so I have almost finished a big project with Powerlink. So Powerlink is the government owned corporation that looks after the transmission lines. So everyone is very familiar with Energex or so Energy Queensland. So they connect the house or the property to the transmission lines, whereas Powerlink kind of does all of the transmission lines. They're taking the lead role. So they're like the first, first ones to really start recruiting in the space. So what they've needed, they're really engagement kind of roles. That's where we're at at the moment. So with that, it's more, it's not so much around energy, it would be around any kind of engagement. So, mm -hmm. you know, it could be roads, it could be civil, it could be, you've worked at an airport, you've worked, anything to do with engaging with community and stakeholders on large infrastructure projects is where we're at now. However, in saying that, it's about to, there's going to be so much more recruitment than that happens in that space. And we're going to run out of people who have that experience. So what mm -hmm. then happens is first you get what you're really after is in terms of that large infrastructure project. So people from like inland rail or cross river rail or all that, they were definitely candidates that were all also considered at this early stage. But then as time goes on, it will be, you know, people who have any kind of engagement. So I know people on this call have had lots of like, I think there might be some people in this call who have had lots of stakeholder engagement in terms of government, um, you know, political, you know, electorate offices, those types of things that will definitely be relevant as well. So it's not so much about energy sector experience. It's more about engagement. That's the that's what's going to keep me very busy for the next couple of years. Okay. And I guess outside of energy and outside of those, you know, um, personally, as an agency owner, I'm getting a lot of uh, inquiries from organisations, all shapes and sizes, yes. who, are, who are going through change. Yes. And a, a lot of that. Are you seeing a bit of that as well? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, change, like what I love about comms is it's so diverse, mm -hmm. it's so broad. And so you start to kind of be known for certain things. So like you would absolutely probably be, you know, that would fall within people go, oh my God, Mel's really great at X, Y, Z. Um, change comms, there's definitely a demand out there. Um, and, but I probably haven't tapped into it enough in the space that I'm in. So mm -hmm. that doesn't mean at all that it's not out there. But so change comms where we're seeing it is in IT projects. So there's a lot of change in IT projects. So for example, the government is going to put in a new system. So like a new piece of technology and they'll get change people in to do work on that project with lots of different technical people. That's a very acquired taste. And I would love to hear your thoughts as well, Mel, on the type of change you do. So with that kind of change, it can be very kind of formulaic. So it suits some people who like that very process driven. It's not, it's hard to use creativity in a way because you, but sometimes you can, but it's very kind of formulaic um, in its approach. Then you've got other kinds of change that you can be working within an organization and working more on organizational change. So like, let's say, Urban Utilities is an example where they are really amazing with flexibility. So they, they'll they run, do change programs and do org, more org change, which is a little bit more creative. Mm. What would be your thoughts, like in terms of the change that you're seeing with organisations and where you use your comm skills? Mm, no, it's a good question. And I wasn't expecting to be asked a question. Aha! So <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> yes. For me personally, it is very much around, uh, yes, technology and digital yeah. transformation. So no matter what organisation you are, whether you're a non-profit or a yes. corporate, 
uh, or a government organization, a lot of digital transformation going on, uh, you know, legacy systems getting thrown yeah. out, all new things yeah. getting put in. Yeah. But there's also a lot of people change. And I think particularly in the technology sector, we're seeing as uh, AI becomes more prevalent, yeah. There's, there are absolutely roles that are going to, to change. So yeah. we are being approached by tech companies and bigger companies where they are going through a big change in terms of their people and the skills yeah. that they need because of technology. So that yeah. is the other big, big piece I'm seeing. Do you find ProSci or Adcar, like, do you find there's like, in terms of your experience, from what I've seen, a lot of it, if that is a space that you're interested in, I'm probably getting requests for kind of pro-sci as right. the main methodology, but there's so many different ones. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any, I think Dilka, I think, saw put a chat. Is there anyone else that has any other kind of um, change comes my, is that change project managers tend to do the comps themselves? Yes, I've yeah, noticed that as well. there's a lot of that, you know, yes. where you see them, yeah, roles are advertised as changing communications managers. And that, mm. that was, I always find that quite intriguing because it's, you know, I think they're quite different. Yeah, um, I agree. Complementary, but really different, different um, areas of expertise. So I agree. it's always interesting when when I see that, I kind of go, uh oh, what's going to go on there? Totally. And, um, we, and the, the other place where I'm seeing and having the, the last few organisations I've worked for change being really prevalent around operating model changes. Yes. So, you know, where, and, you know, some of that is tech driven. But yeah. in some cases, it's really just about, you know, gearing up to be able to deliver a different service or a yeah. service in a different way, you know, that results in a big operating model change and then, you know, lots of change communication. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. So Tass has put in the chat there uh, in terms of methodologies. We use a huge variety, ended up mashing them all together and calling it ready, willing and able. Love Which is it. Great. <laughs> Which is great. Love it. So, yeah, so change is definitely a part. So in terms of if I think of where the market is going is change, I think is a great skill to have regardless. Yeah. I don't know what you, go, what you guys think. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't necessarily do change comms, if you get the opportunity to learn some kind of change methodology, I think it is great. I would yeah. absolutely take that opportunity because people often say to me, what should I do? Should I do an MBA? Should I do this? Mm -hmm. Should I, you know, and sometimes sometimes it, in terms of direct employability, it's harder to quantify some things. Like I always say, if you want to do an MBA, do an MBA because you actually want to do it. Don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll directly impact your employability. Whereas some courses I know do. For hmm. example, like IAP2 is absolutely something that is a tick and flick. A client will say they have to have this. So I'm like, if you want to get into your engagement, do it because it'll, automatically benefit you and I almost feel like change methodologies are the same and I think Cass has agreed there um, that it's something that people go oh that's great she's got pro site awesome tick and it can be something on a resume that people see that that will add value mm -hmm. um just on that, so it is a question around qualifications. So yes. for me, looking at doing an MBA, I kind of went, oh, $40,000, $50,000 later. Yes. Is that actually a return on investment? Maybe not. Yeah. But even down to whether you really need a comms degree. So I would like to think that we would in it from a professionalization yes. of what we do. But I know like in my team alone, um, only one of them has a comms team, uh, degree. Yeah. The other have finance degrees or law or business degrees and they're excellent communicators so what are your thoughts on qualifications Erica so I'm going to preface this by saying everything I say today someone else will have a totally different opinion <laughs> so nothing I say especially when we get to resume but so this is just my thoughts and based on the patterns that I see so no in general like it's not impossible to get a comms degree oh, sorry to get a great comms job without a comms degree however it's rare, I would still say. And that only reason being is that it's the it's the lower, it's the junior jobs that often you need that to get those junior jobs to start with. Mm. However, it doesn't mean that there's like, there's a lot that feed into it. So like law, you know, often you need to be able to write. It's really about whether you can show and demonstrate that you're a professional writer. So, um, you know, law or legal quals, psych quals, all of those are often enough to segue across. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, 
you can't get it. It's just getting those earlier jobs, you know, like the ones when you're 80K, 90 it's hard to get those kind of roles to break into those without a degree. But mm -hmm. like later on, I've got some, ama I know some amazing people. I know one in particular who's super senior, super like qualified, like in terms of her experience. And she didn't, she just never got around to finishing her degree. And it doesn't matter now because no one's going to care if she has a degree or not. Like it actually doesn't matter. I've got another person who's going for a regional role and will probably get paid 350K and she just never finished her comms degree. It doesn't matter that she didn't finish it. So I know that's a bit of a convoluted answer, but um, I definitely still think there's a place for comms degrees. Hmm. And we've got some comments in the chat here. Uh, we've got, for me, experience is better than any degree. And like to your point, if you have no experience in early in your career, maybe yes. you do need that degree to show, hey, I've at yep. least got some basic yes. knowledge. Yeah. Of, of what I can do. Um, and then Emma's written, I'm on the fence about looking at an MBA. However, I'm investigating a reputable MBA online as an international student via scholarship. Great idea. Um, from an overseas uni, many more scholarship opportunities for international students. Ooh. There you go. Good to know. Yes. Um, and Dilk has written, I sometimes feel that when people move across from other fields, it gives weight to the view that anyone can do comms. Yeah. So there is that risk that, yeah. um, yes. It and certainly, I think yeah. when I started my degree uh, or my career, I won't say how long ago, but a long time ago. Uh, you didn't necessarily, you if you were in communications, you probably were a journalist at some point. Yes. And yes. it was very much, comms was a very fledgling uh, thing. Internal comms and change comms wasn't even a thing. Nobody knew yes. what that was. <laughs> yes. So it did give rise to that idea that, well, anybody can write an email. Yes. Anybody can. Yes. But I, yes. hopefully that feels like we've moved a bit from there in the last 20 odd years. Yeah, hope, totally. But, hmm. So it is, um, yeah, it's a tricky yeah. one, but you can definitely do it without a degree. Mm -hmm. However, it's like about continual learning. Like some people, although they might not have a degree, they're at every, they're at IB, IABC, they're at networking events, they're a mm -hmm. lifelong learner. So I don't, I think you still need to keep updating your skills and learning more things. And, you know, you still need to be a lifelong learner. Um, to be able to absorb those skills if you haven't got it from a degree. Hmm. So just on that, I guess, what are those attributes that your that employers are looking for that you're noticing? I mean, for me personally, yeah. lifelong learner is 100% of top value for me yeah. when I'm considering an, an employee. What about, what are you seeing? Um, so it's really diverse. Like comms like is all about the world of grey. So there's no like, there's not, like hard and fast because there's so many different kinds of roles that are within that space um but in general have to be a strong writer like that's still the number one thing and you'd be surprised a lot of comms people can't write I'm sure you guys have hired these some of these people sometimes who I couldn't tell you how many resumes I get or cover letters that I get that have spelling mistakes or you know like so so being a writer is still obviously the core of what we do of what you guys do um so that is a skill. Also, someone who is politically astute. So mm -hmm. that is still a really important skill. You need to understand how what's happening in the world. Not as in, I have a political alliance. Not about that. So understanding how like the the stake you know the stakeholder ecosystem works, having a nose for a good story, thinking about reputation. You know, showing that you um, are it's not a bad thing to have been at one organisation for a long time, but mm -hmm. being in the same job where you haven't kind of changed or something can sometimes be an area where they think, oh, will they be able to pick up new skills? So just showing that you have adapted and picked up new skills along the way. Um, yeah. The other thing is like also being able to do, like to be a confident to go up and interact and build, take people on the journey. Because with comms, a lot of the time, it's about being able to, you know, build relationships, share stories, influence, all of those kinds of skills. Okay. That's really good insight, actually. I know you said it was a world of grey, but that's actually very good insights that you've just shared I don't know there. What, <laughs> I know a lot of the people here are higher people on their roles what are the things that are you that you're finding challenging to find in people when you're when you've been recruiting at the moment I don't know if it's worthwhile some people putting that mm. down if, if you the, are a hiring the, manager please pop some thoughts in the chat or come off mute yeah. and, and share your response to that question um, I've just hired somebody myself and for me what's what's important is a creative mindset so I don't mean that in an artistic ability I mean that in an, more of an innovative thinking 
So yep. being able to think outside the square, try things. Solutions. Exactly, yep. solutions. What I did find in that interviewing process, um, I had very specific instructions in the job advert, which was kind of the first test. Could they follow yep. the yes. instructions? And there were very few that actually did come through and do that. Um, but also, I think, uh, particularly, I interviewed just a couple of grads just to see, you know, um, is there a fit there? And for me personally, as a, a, I only, I'm a small business. If I was a bigger agency, I could take on grads and give them the mentoring and the learning I would want to give them. But they weren't prepared enough or didn't have enough, uh, I guess, practical skills yet for me to be able to do that. So that was me personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's people uh, just commenting in the chat here. So Cass has written relevant experience with platforms, yes, such as Workplace, yes. Yammer, HubSpot, being able to demonstrate stakeholder management. Yes, big one. Yeah. Uh, Emma's written, I would love a strong writer and someone who can speak to a client and have a positive client relationship. Yes. So proactive, yes, not being afraid yep. to learn. Um, and we've got, I've, oh, whoops, just gone through there. I feel for people applying for roles that have worked in a big department where they're not really given opportunities to branch out and learn new skills, but in instead told to swim in their lane. Yes. Yes, that's hard. Yeah, that is hard. And Dilk has written, small P, political, definitely hard to find, comes with experience, basic writing, relationship management and account yeah. management. I mean, the thing, with the basic things like, having someone with a can-do attitude who's like, yeah, and positive and resilient, that that's something that, I mean, is actually quite difficult to find, surprisingly. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's probably still, you know, when you meet someone, you're like, oh, my God, I'll, I'll train you. You're so good. I'll train you because there's something about it. So, yeah, that would definitely, yeah, as Cass says, I'll, I'll take can-do attitude. <laughs> yes, totally. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so on just on those sorts of roles, are you seeing more, I guess, short-term, long-term contracts as opposed to permanent roles or is it kind of a mix of both? So for the last like couple of years, there's been hardly any contracting because when employment is so low, people don't want a contract role. There's so many jobs, um, there's so many jobs mm -hmm. out there. So they will, even if a client wanted a contract solution, it was very hard. Like we could do it, we had a bit of it, don't get me wrong. But it was actually really hard to find people for it unless you're paying super high rates. Mm -hmm. But what we're starting to see now that it's kind of, we're starting to see more government contracts come through from, um, yeah, sorry, we're starting to see more contracts come through from government, which could potentially be a reflection of the, you know, that we're going into an election year. And so government starts to spend, you know, to get lots of initiatives out, make sure we've got lots of stuff happening that is fresh in people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely a lot more contracts coming out in government, whereas mm -hmm. there wasn't much at all for a while. Um, but, yeah, a lot of it is still um, permanent at the moment. And I think that's because that's driven a lot by candidates just saying, oh, no, that's what I want. Okay. But I don't know, there's, I have a lot of people who just prefer freelance like yourself mm. or, you know, who've like, and there's, I feel like there's so much work out there in that space that a lot of agencies uh, can't find people to, they can't hire people, enough people to do the work that you could go and If you decided you wanted to be a contractor, you could kind of go around and find quite a bit of freelance work at the moment. I don't know, is that, the, mm. is that correct in my assumption? What would be... Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly that seeing know. that. Yeah, um, and I know, and Alex has put a, a, a comment in the chat that it's quite similar. You're, it's difficult. Try, you've actually almost got to sell the job oh, totally. uh, to the person because there is such a competitive market right now. And I know a client we worked with last year, we were brought in to fill a gap for them because they had hired somebody to fill this role and then last minute they got a better offer, so they pulled out. Yeah. So they re-advertised got another person through that person, signed the contract and then went, oh, actually I've been counter offered by my current employer. I'm going to do that. So after trying twice to hire, they went, you know what, we'll just get Mel in and her team and they can just fill this gap for us right yeah. now. Um, absolutely seeing that. It's crazy. And you, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's a big part of my job is um, educating clients that you need to impress candidates. So gone are the days of like kind of like a power shift where it's like, I'm going to make you feel really nervous in an interview and I'm going to put some pressure on you and I'm going to see if you give me a good answer. 
you know, mm. whereas now it's not about that. A candidate, if that's the experience a candidate has, often they'll go, oh, I didn't get a good vibe. So there's a real shift now where it's really an exchange of trying to, for the for the employer to say, this is a place you want to work. Also, the candidate needs to impress them, but it's 50-50. It's like a, it's like a, more like a marriage or a relationship rather than just master and slave type of thing. Mm. And there's still some clients, though, that are stuck in that old kind of mentality. Um, but if you do find a great candidate, I'm like, I say to a client, you need to impress them. Like, you need to turn it on. We've got to close this. You need to win them <laughs> over because there is so many other people out there who are fighting for good talent as well. Yeah. And that seems to be coming through in the chat here as well. Uh I recruited recently and got a lot of pushback on commuting despite there being a flexible work arrangements on offer. Yeah. Someone didn't want to drive 15 minutes to our office, which is interesting. Um, and as a consultant, there seems to be a lot of work around in the energy department yes. particularly, but it seems to be that slowed down a bit since the start of the year. And so Alex has asked a question, are we starting to, are we seeing a lot of internal promotions over external hiring as a result of these external challenges, Erica? It's really hard, it's a mix. That's a tricky one. Um, I mean, it's. I think that's awesome if they can do that. Um, but like a lot of the roles that I'm seeing are totally newly created roles as well. So you'll still have people who will apply internally, but then there's the backfill. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's hard. That's a tricky one. I wouldn't be able to answer that um, straight up. No, but that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, bigger businesses don't want the headcount but have the work. Yes. Hi, mm. Roseanne. I haven't spoken to you in ages. <laughs> um, but, yes, there is there's so much work. And I think also Emma asked about what's the best freelance search areas. Mm. What do you think? What would you say? And I'm, then I'll tell you what I'll say. I'm, put, I'm, put, <laughs> I'm, turning, the, I'm turning the tables on you, Mel. Yeah, and, or, and anybody mind. else who's on, yes. on the chat who is um, who is a freelancer or consultant, there are uh, services like Freelancing Gems and uh, some of those sorts of groups that you can yeah. go through. For me personally, when I first started out, it was relationships. It was the people that I used to work with, have worked with over the last 20 years. And I just put out a message and said, hey, I'm about to start freelancing if you've got anything throw up my way. And straight away, I got people yes. asking because there's work there. And to that comment about, you know, organisations have the work but don't have the resources, like, cool. I know Mel, I know she can do this stuff. We'll just lob yes. that over the fence, yes. which is kind of how I inadvertently started my agency because I got so busy so quickly. Yes. Um, but that's me personally. And staying on the radar on LinkedIn is a big one. Um, anybody else have anything? Uh, Roseanne said, yep, agree, relationships, socials, SEO. Yeah. Mm. It's begun. What were your thoughts, Erica? I would also reach out to all of the all the PR agencies, local PR agencies, and just say, I'm open to freelancing if you have mm. anything. Because sometimes they'll win work um, and not have the people to deliver it. Yes. Um, so um, I would, and keeping in mind, obviously, I know this just in case people don't, you know, freelancing is like you just can do, you get a piece of work that you do whenever. So um, it's kind of, it, it can be sometimes hard to, to balance. Like what are some of the challenges in terms of freelancing? It's hard. It's either feast or famine sometimes, isn't it? Mm. You'll either have heaps on or not. But I know like, you know, I would reach out to Phillips Group, Roland, um, Elevate, uh, like all of them and just say, if you need anything, I'm available. And that can just be a good starting point. I would do lots of networking, like what Mel does with, you know, IBC, Priya, any of those kind of things, um, you know, do it like do it. It's I often say to candidates in comms, do a comms strategy or a PR strategy about mm. yourself, just like you do for all these businesses, like do it for yourself. Who are you, what channels are you going to use? Um that would definitely be something that I would do as well. Yeah, it's a really good, really good insight. So Rex in the uh, in the chat has asked on the idea of comms professionals in different settings or industries. Do you think it's better to have been in one subject matter or industry for a long time, or a wide range across their career? What are the advantages or disadvantages of both? I also appreciate this is influenced by permanent or temporary or contracting arrangements. This is a good question. Mm. So there's there's strengths in both strategies. So say, for example, if you are, if I have a job in energy, 
and you have worked in energy or oil and gas or something like that your whole career, it makes it a lot easier for me to put you forward in some way because it's like like for like. But in saying that, it also shows your depth and um, ability to apply your skills on a whole range of settings if you've worked across a whole range of different industries. So that especially if you one day want to be uh, executive leader, I think having a broad spectrum, like a broad range of industries is actually really powerful because it makes, it means that you're also, like if you think, say if you've only been in mining for a long time, you've got to know a certain stakeholder group really, really well because that's what you've done your whole time. Whereas if you then were in mining and then you went like, what were we talking about? Good start, early learning or somewhere like that. The stakeholder group is going to be so different compared to where you're at. So I do think there is value in working across lots of different industries if your career takes that trajectory. In saying that, it doesn't mean that it's not good to just have a, you know, be a mining and an energy specialist either. What would, what would your thoughts be, Mel? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, me personally, I have a huge variety of in my background. So yeah. uh, mining, construction, police, uh, non-profits, Banking. childcare, financial services. Yes. That stood me in good stead in terms of starting my own business because I, yep. can, I can talk to all of those. But also when I was an executive manager in my last corporate role, yeah, I had those nuances from other industries and could to your point earlier, the, the small P political sort of yes. understanding as well. So you do bring things in, but with even though I had that wide variety of industry experience, I had niched myself into internal and change comms and crisis comms specialist. So external PR, that sort of stuff was not my jam. Yeah. Uh, so I think you can still narrow your, your yeah. specialization within those industries and, and yeah. whether that's a broader industry mix or just a couple. That's my yep. personal opinion. I agree. But, yeah. And because you also don't, so you also don't want to try and be everything to everyone. So, which I know is kind of, so, you know, mm. it's still good to, to find something that you know you're really great in. So, for example, exactly like what you did, you worked out what you're really great in and you applied it to lots of in, different industries, which showed you di- your diversity. Um, so, yeah, I, mm. I think, uh, yeah. What was some of, there was another part to that question though about, Permanent temporary and contracting, I think, that I, I missed. Uh, um, but yes. Ooh, Rex okay. just responded to that. Oh, yes. Oh, so you go ahead, Erica. Where it says, what are the event? And it says, I also appreciate this is influenced by permanent temporary and contracting. So the other thing is, is temporary contract is actually a really great way, though, if you are financially stable and secure enough to do this. I'll put that caveat. <laughs> if you can take some contract roles, it can be extremely beneficial to you for you to get to where you want to go. So for example, government. So many people say to me, I really want to break into government, but they're in the private sector or whatever. The best way to get into government is a contract job. So that is just like, without a doubt, the absolute best way to get. So what that means is you would be working on you and you payroll for like like a labor hire kind of thing. So it might be six months or whatever. It might start off that way. You'll get a casual loading of 25% loading on top of your hourly rate instead of accruing leave. Government hires those all the time and they can be, you can, I can, you know, you can get them within a week. If you were to try and get onto government payroll, you could be doing selection criteria for the rest of your life, (laughs) just trying to get an interview. That sounds terribly (laughs) painful. (laughs) Yes. And like, and I'm, and Natalie's looking at me smiling going, oh my God, yes, this is the truth. (laughs) Um, So how it works, this is just the science of, been recruiting for government for like 15 years it's just how it works whereas if you get a contract job you go in there you're doing all those things we said at the beginning you're positive you like can do you're getting on youth you work you know you're kind of networking internally often those people then go into fixed term contract they apply for jobs people know they're amazing even though there's other candidates they get a look in so mm. sometimes you have to have a bit of a strategy to how you get to where you want to be. But obviously, you've got to think about your financial setting as well. Mm. So there's some good questions coming through here. Dilk has written, uh, can a broader range of settings or industries suggest you can't stick at something for long? Yes. But it, this is so hard because you're right. You're totally yeah. right. Well, so, so yeah. I, I have been told by a recruiter because I've you know moved around a lot. Yes. Like yes. Thinking, you know, where I am now is the longest I've been anywhere. And, you know, before that was probably four years, you know, max, and then, you know, two years stints. 
And those two year stints, even though they were in sort of state government where you may have sort of done a couple of years in various departments yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, personally, I considered it that I had one employer. Totally. And just Which working I would different too. portfolios. Yes. But I yes. was actually told by um, a recruiter that, yeah, it's not a good look. So, yeah, I just wondered about that and, and how you frame that up. I mean, this is probably moving into resumes and things, but yeah. how do you frame that so it doesn't look like you're a job hopper, you know? It's very, this is a really, really good question. And so what, what I always say is, how the human brain works is we're trying to sort things. So like, you know, you're trying to see patterns and make assumptions to quickly move through applications. So if you're an internal recruiter and you've got a heap of resumes and you're quickly scanning them because they literally people will look at a resume and scan it like this and then move on and make a decision. So there is times where some people will bring with them their own kind of bias that that's how they think. They think if someone's in a job for two years, that means that they can't, they won't stay on. There is people who are like that and it's going to be hard to overcome that. However, you can't, can't, you can only do what you can do with your experience. So you can't lie, but you need to find a recruiter who gets you and who advocates for you and who's going to put you forward anyway. Where I, so my own red flags that I would see, I'm more about if someone's got six months, six months, six months, six months, six months, I'm like, are they ever getting through their probation? That's my thoughts as if there's a heap of six months because, but if there's like a six month contract here and there, that's fine. So there, and also like if someone is one year, one year, one year, one year, one year for the last 15 years, yes. But even sometimes there's a reason for that as well. So my thoughts are you can't, you can't lie about your experience. You've just got to be honest and you've got to find a recruiter who's going to be a voice for your resume. And when you're going to a client, is going to try their hardest to advocate for you and see if they can influence. But otherwise, it's just one of those things that's hard to overcome, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry, I, no, I think that's a, <laughs> it's a really years great answer. Fine. Four years is like, oh, my God, these days people don't stay in jobs. Like if you're moving every three years, it's not an issue. Mm. Back in the day, that used to be an issue. These days, it's not. It's you yeah, know, yeah. So mm. I think you've got nothing to worry about, Delka. You've got a great background. <laughs> <laughs> so we got um, another question here from Rex, just a follow up. Um, would you say some industries are easier to transition due to subject matter association? Example: Some people in mining might have trouble getting into childcare. So what could an applicant do to manage those possible preconceptions? A really good question, Rex. Yes. So I always talk about this thing called the segue job. Sometimes you need a segue job to get you where you want to be. So I'll give you an example. I get heaps of journos who want to come in, go, break into in-house. Um, everyone wants an ex-journo in their team, <laughs> but rarely do people want to be the first one to hire the journo into in-house. Um, and so what I say to that journo is sometimes you need a segue job, the in-between job that you do to help shimmy you across. So in the instance of like mining to childcare, if you were like, I really want to work in childcare, you might have to go, okay, so it's a community services type of organisation. It doesn't say you don't apply, but if you were like, I keep trying and we're having no luck, try and think of something that you can leverage off in between. Um, I mean, that's a really extreme example, mining to childcare, but maybe like a community services type of organisation or a more like government, even go from mining to government, then to childcare, because government is still kind of very community focused and you could go and work for Department of Energy or um, mining and resources or something like that. Um, I actually went from construction and mining to childcare. Oh, there um, you so go. it can be done. It, it can there be you done. Go. <laughs> and often it's not so much about the candidate, it's about the other candidates that you're up against that might have just been something more relevant. Mm. Do you know? Um, yes. So uh, another question here from uh, Emma. I've moved states and while my network is extensive, it is in Canberra and South Australia. So what are your suggestions to grow that aside from going to events and LinkedIn? I feel like I'm starting from the bottom again. Really good question. It's a very good question. And Brisbane's like, I don't know what you guys think, but Brisbane's still a big country town. <laughs> so we're definitely coming of age, but 
it's still a kind of very much a six degrees of separation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Emma, I know you are very proactive. You are doing so much stuff. So I just want to say that you're definitely a go-getter. So um, I would say doing the stuff that you're doing, you, you put your hand up for all of these events, you reach out to people, you know, you're, um, you need to ask. Like the great thing often is people will intro you. I, I find the, com, the Brisbane comms community really helpful and are happy to put to like meet someone for a coffee so mm. you know like say if you reach out to people and say you know I'm I'm here I'm trying I would love to know you know are you open for a coffee so I can pick your brains on things I don't know do you do you would you agree Mel that that's been your yeah, experience yeah absolutely it is very much a less than six degrees of separation to be honest yes. in in Brisbane especially in which Coles. Yes, which works in your favour if you've been here a long time, obviously, but less in your favour if you ever want to branch out into like Sydney or Melbourne, for example. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I've definitely, uh, case in point, I went to a networking event about a month ago and met a woman who had just moved here from the UK for her work. And uh, as we we're chatting, I said, look, happy to meet up for coffee. And she's like, you know what? People here actually mean that. I've yes. had so many... Act, coffees with people they, they don't just say that they they're yes. actually saying they're actually meeting me for coffee so she's <laughs> she she picked that up pretty quickly so it is a a community that is it is very supportive I don't think yes. there's a whole lot of sense of competition between people very much it's very much a yeah we, we love expanding our network we love helping each other I think so yes. events absolutely get out there reach out to people on LinkedIn, have a chat. I've actually just uh, onboarded a new subcontractor who I met through her husband who was at a networking event that I was at I love and had a coffee with her and she'd moved up from Melbourne and I managed to you know, um, bring her on board in the last couple of months. So yeah, it is those degrees of separation. Absolutely. Is my experience at least. Awesome. Yes. And Emma's just written, the Brisbane comms community is like a big warm hug, at least in my uh, experience. So people respect your experience. They absolutely do. I would agree. Yeah. So Erica, on experience, let's talk resumes. Yes. Um, you know, I've seen so many tips and pieces of advice of this over the last 20 years or so. I have my own feelings on them. Yeah. But you're the expert. What, what are, well, like, I guess, yeah. the, the five, what are the good, I guess, three to five top tips you would give so us? This is absolutely something where you, people would go, what? Someone else just <laughs> told me something else and I've just changed my resume. Now I've got to change back. <laughs> okay, so there is no hard and fast rule about this. So I'll just preface that. But in from my experience and my colleagues around me, these are the top things I would tell you. Number one, and I'm so sorry if people have done this, <laughs> don't pay someone to do your resume. <laughs> and I know that's really going to be, some people are going to go, no, I've just paid $800. The reason why I say that is because you're a comms people and you're probably better writers than the people who are writing resumes. Now, that could be wrong, but I just know there's some people go, oh, I can write a resume and they're just going into templates and doing it. So, you know, it'd be different if you were from a different profession, but comms people are writers. So I would generally say that. So that's the first thing. Second thing is resumes do not need to be fancy. They are in terms of the world of comms. If you're a marketer, different, you know, you might want to do something really creative with, you know, but that's not comms. So white page, black, you know, basic font, just like I can send, I've got a template, I can send everyone. It's super basic, bullet points, headings, not too many crazy fonts, you know. So that's the thing. Sometimes people think, oh, I haven't done it. I haven't changed it, the style of it in 10 years. That's probably still correct. It's probably still <laughs> the same style. So how like how it doesn't matter so much in terms of length. If it's three to five pages, totally fine. If it's 20 pages, too far. But don't try and if you've got a lot of experience, don't try and put it on one or two pages. That's not going to sell you. So, you know, three to five pages, totally fine. When I get a resume, this is what I do. I get a resume, I skim it through the first page. If it hasn't grabbed me on the first page, I will barely get to the second page. So that's what you've got to try and think is literally, or it might take you ages to do, it's like as if you worked all this time on an assignment for uni and then they skimmed the first page and made a judgment. That's pretty much what we do. If I skim it and there's something in there that I'm looking for, which is generally how much experience you've got, the companies you've worked at, the role titles you've got, then I'll look a bit longer. And then it's really just a tool for me to pick up the phone and reach out. 
-hmm. So I will never actually read every line of your resume. However, it's all I do. I This is all I do it day in, day out. Whereas if I was a hiring manager and did recruitment as my side, you know, like never did it and I had to all of a sudden recruit, they would be reading every single sentence of your resume. So you've got to kind of cater for both. And that's the same when it comes to cover letters. Do you need to do a cover letter? Don't you need to do a cover letter? I rarely read cover letters, but you absolutely need to include a cover letter um, because some of our clients will not even look at a resume without a cover letter. They will look at a resume, they will look read a cover letter first because they feel like that makes more sense to them. Whereas I've just been looking at resumes forever, so I am just know what I'm looking at in terms of trying to work out whether to classify someone or not. Mm. Um, Can I just make a point on the cover letter? Make sure yes. you don't just copy and paste from one you've done previously and keep the previous, like the, <laughs> uh, the other details in the there. I've had job. a couple of those. Yes. Where it's been, I'm applying for this oh editor role with blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I know. that's not me. I know. So, that's an yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The other thing I would say is you want to have it chronologically backwards. So most recent job first, going backwards. You need about 10 to 15 years experience on there. You don't need to go back, you know, too far beyond that. You can just put further details of experience available upon request, something like that. That's fine. Um, you want to go job, duties, and then a couple of achievements. So mm-hmm. sometimes people will put that competent. There's another style which I don't particularly like where you put all your competencies all in one big thing. And then you just list your work. But I don't know when you did that. Like, was that 20 years ago that you did that thing or was that recent? So I like to see it in the actual kind of under each heading. Um, And the other tip is you can put referees available upon request. That's totally normal. It protects the privacy of your referees. Those are really great tips. So uh, you're saying don't pay somebody because you can write, although Emma did have a good point here that somebody else she paid did help her articulate and pull out some information about herself. So it's always helpful. Yes. Um, Keep it simple. And uh, three to five pages is good. 20, too long. Include a cover letter. Make sure it's tailored and the correct person and correct job. Um, Go back 10 to 15 years max if you've got a lot of experience. Have your jobs, your duties and your achievements and it's okay to say referees available on request. I think those yep, are really totally. good tips. I mean, for me personally, I also like to see, depending on the role, if it's a more junior role, I'd, yep. I'd like to see more tasks, you know, what actual things did you do? Yes. Whereas more yep. senior roles, I like to see, well, what value did you add? Yeah. So yes, you could, you know, by this stage, I expect you could be able to do all those things, but I want to know what did you do differently that changed something that added value in some way yes. as well? Yep, totally. Um, I'm just seeing if anyone has any other questions about resumes. No. The other thing I would say, so this is something that seems really um, obvious, but sometimes it's a good reminder. If you get to an interview, the best thing that you can remember is that you're a storyteller. So sometimes, you know, everyone's head of the star technique to answer questions, situation, task, action, result. Um <laughs> That is a great system, don't get me wrong, but it seems very dry and some comps people are like, oh, that just sounds foul. I'm like, okay, well, the same thing kind of is about telling a story. So what I would definitely say is remember before you get to an interview, bring a lot, and this this kind of touches in with that value piece, Think about some really great stories that you can tell. Short stories, not like ones that are going to take 20 minutes, but short little stories that tell your experience. Because when the things that can clients always tell me when they leave an interview and the things I remember when I leave an interview is a really cool example, a really cool story. So someone saying about, oh, my God, we had to do a change thing and this was the the situation and what we did was you know, we did X, Y, Z. A story that I always remember recently was this person who did engagement and it was to, to engage with bike, like with the biking community, mm-hmm. the downhill biking community who hated, you know, the organisation that she was working with <laughs> and her, what she taught herself 
how to do downhill biking as a way to connect with this group to the point where she got the group so much on board that they nominated her for an award. So, you know, those stories, whereas other stuff I don't remember. So that would be my other tip. Try and think of those times when you've added value, put it into a short story and use it in your examples. Yeah. And I have a, sorry. Oh, sorry, go for it, Emma. I was going to say, I've got a really good suggestion here, which may be relevant to some of the ladies in this chat. So um, a lot of people ask me in interviews or, uh, what can you demonstrate that you're efficient? And I've told Erica this story, so I know she knows it's coming. But um, the way I do that is I had I went for baby number two and got two, so I had three under eighteen months. <laughs> so oh I think it sums up totally. both my efficiency and my organisation and how I manage quite well. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of ways that women can demonstrate those motherhood and parenting abilities and make it funny and relatable whilst telling a lot of unsaid skills that you would have as well. Hmm. I, can't, I still can't believe you have three under 18 months. <laughs> well, no, it's, the twins are almost four now, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think like you hit on a good point there, storytelling, you know, our brains are wired to re re yes. remember stories. Where, where That's how we're biologically developed. So storytelling is such a powerful tool. Um, and you know, as comms people, we know that. So why aren't we using it more and yes. to sell ourselves is probably more the question. Um, and then the flip side of that is, okay, if, if I'm a hiring manager, what are some of the questions I should be asking in an interview? What are some of the things I would I should be asking and to determine if this person is the person for the role? Because on paper, we are very different to how yeah. we're showing up. So the, the hard thing is that often people who interview the best and like you can hire, like interviewing is hard because there's some people who interview really well because they've had to do it a lot because they mm. move around a lot. And then people who aren't used to interviewing can interview really badly, but they can be the best person for the job. So it's about trying to kind of trying to get to that core of the person. So if you were to ask all of my co colleagues at UNU, we all have a different interview style and different technique. My technique, my style is about trying to make the person feel as comfortable as possible. So you want to first, when you interview, I think, is as much as you can, try to break the ice. They're going to be nervous. Try to make them feel as calm as possible because then you're actually going to be able to see the best in them, especially if they're a shy person. The other question that I love that you don't have to do but I love is saying, you know, at different times in our life, we're motivated by different things when we choose a job. Mm -hmm. And, if, if you know, sometimes in the early in our career, we're motivated by career progression or money or work life balance or flexibility. But, you know, if you ask someone like, where are you right now in your life? What is important to you? And what are those things that are going to make this job the right job? That will give you an insight firstly into where they're at and whether your job is the right job. So if they say work life balance and you can't offer it, then you can straight away like bring that, bring, bring something like that to the, to the forefront so they don't leave early on. So that would be my first thing is you want to firstly, Make them relax. Try and work out what's actually right for them. And then the other the other things, if you can, is asking for specific examples. So just say, can you give me an example? You mentioned you love change management. That's awesome. What's an example when you did that? Like, I'm, sure, I'm guessing there'd be heaps of change management at Suncorp. Can you give me an example of when you did that? So if you can start and then if they go, oh, 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 oh yeah, oh, well, um, uh, you, oh, you know, you kind of know they might just be. Yeah exaggerate a little bit yeah I heard some really good advice uh in a podcast I was listening to and it's an organ company in Israel of all places where uh the first question they ask is tell me something you're passionate about because it relaxes people so it could be anything yeah. I'm passionate about surfboarding why are you passionate about surfboarding what do you love about yeah. it and it helps just relax people yes. early on and get yeah. to know them a little better. And this company also does a second chance interview. So if they can tell somebody's really nervous and they, they think, look, I don't think they've performed as well as they could in this interview, yeah. you get a second chance interview, which I thought was fantastic. I love it. Yeah. And there's like, honestly, there's so many times where the right candidate interviewed badly under the circumstances and where a coffee follow up brings out, you know, a totally different side to them. But there's different, you know, there's different thoughts and schools of thought on that but I definitely think if you can try to get someone as relaxed as possible you will see the true their true you know side much better. Yeah absolutely. Um, Emma's put a question here what are some of your top tips for helping people control their nerves in an interview when I've interviewed people in the past their nerves really get in the way. Okay 
So what I do is I start off by getting them to talk about something they already know. So like what you said, so I'll go, you know, thanks so much for coming and like, like icebreaker kind of stuff, which is total, you know, boring, but you do it just to get the, the nerves out. And then I'll say, can we just start? I'd just love to get a bit of a high level overview of your background. And so let's have a look. Can you just kind of walk me through your background, starting towards the earlier part of your career and come to to present it just high level just so I've got an idea and sometimes when people are talking about that they know it so they're like well I start off and I did uni and I did this and then they just feel safe that they're talking about something that they know really well and so sometimes and you can like throw in some an anecdotes or something oh did you go to school with this blah, 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 whatever and then often by the time you actually get to the question part they've kind of spoken you've connected and it's kind of relaxed everyone that's often what I think, rather than just going sitting down and going, here we go, straight into it, that can be like a good technique. I don't know, has anyone else got any other ideas? Or things well, I think when, when you're, for a person who is the interviewee, um, again, some good advice I've, I've received in the past is try, when you say to people who are nervous and anxious, calm down, What's that the when when does that ever work? Right? Totally. When has that ever actually worked? Yes. So if you can turn that nervous energy into excitement, because it's you, it's a heightened state as well, yeah. but actually turn it into excitement. I'm ex, I'm actually excited to be. I'm excited to talk about what yes. I can bring and those sorts of things. Um, and and the other advice I would give is just practice, practice, practice. Role play yeah. with people and role play with your dog. Like yeah, <laughs> like yeah. just practice. Yeah, but that's fun. me personally. Nerves are, nerves are tough, but yeah, I think yeah, it's one of these things. And people say I was so nervous, and to, I always say to people, being nervous means you're really interested in the job. So mm. clients actually, it's not a bad thing to be nervous. It's sometimes if you're too relaxed, that can yes. be more of an issue. So 100%. yes. Yeah. Well, look, we're almost at time and we've only got three minutes left. Does anybody have any other questions for Erica while you've got her? Not that she's hard to find. If you Yes, reach wanna... out to me if you would like to connect or if you're looking for a job. I will send you some, I'll send it through to you, Mel, if you like, a template, resume template. It's certainly not, you know, the only way to do it, but I'll send that through to you. Absolutely. Um, yes. I'm happy we'll send that out for questions. sure. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, that was a lot of gold in an, a very short amount of time. Um, can we all just join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Erica? Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, I've popped some links in the chat there for our upcoming events. So if you are interested in building your network, this is what we're here for. We have a breakfast coming up on the 13th of July at the Point Hotel at Kangaroo Point, all on things psychological safety. So we do find that um, it doesn't matter what industry you work in, there are workplaces that just don't feel psychological, psychologically safe. So what that feels like, you know, I don't feel like I can speak up in a meeting. I feel like I'm always given the work that nobody else wants. I feel, you know, you may not know the term, but you know what it feels like. So we've got a really great guest speaker for that, Kylie Leota. She's actually worked very closely with one of our board members previously um, to help him overcome some of this stuff as well. So we thought, why not bring it out into the open. There are group discounts available. So if you've got a team and you want to bring them along to that, please do. Uh, but that'll be a really great event. And then we have early bird tickets open in at the moment. All of these are free for our members, by the way. But if you aren't a member, early bird tickets are now available for uh, our keynote event in August on the impact of generative AI and how to prepare for a future of innovation and automation. So that should be a really great event. Uh, Bosco Anthony's running that one. He recently spoke at the World Conference in Toronto. He's one of our previous board members. And what he doesn't know about AI and automation and what's coming down the line isn't worth knowing. So that, that'll be a really great event as well. And we've got plenty more in the pipeline. So again, stay tuned with us on LinkedIn and Instagram. Uh, they're all free for our members. But if you're not a member, please get in. And uh, we would love to have you on board as a member. But of course, just happy to see you at our events. I've also put a link for a feedback survey in the chat there we'd love your feedback on today's event what's worked well what would you like to hear more of and how can we help you in the future as well so again thank you so much everybody for being on the call today any last questions for erica please shoot them through i can forward them on or you can contact her directly as well and thank you erica awesome thanks so much thanks everybody have a great afternoon bye